Good morning, Open Source fam, and welcome to Salt Lake City. We are here kicking off three days of coverage at KubeCon North America. My name is Savannah Peterson. Very delighted to be joined by my favorite KubeCon co-host, Rob Streche. Rob, good morning. It's so good to be back. Good morning. I mean, the mountain air, the, the snow in the mountains. You I got know. to see some it's snow exciting. yesterday. I, I think it's really great to see the community back together again. I mean, yeah. we, we, we were... It feels like just yesterday Paris was going on. I know. And now we're all back together again. I know, I just want some baguettes and vino after I this know. now that you well. just brought that up. Thanks, thanks for planting that seed. Anyway, we have a, a absolute OG Cube veteran. Hen, Ooh. welcome back to the show. And Peter, first time on the show, both from Thank Corley. you for having us. Thank you. We are very excited to have you. Such a buzzy week. We're just talking about open source community and celebrating open source community. What does the open source community mean to CoreWeave and why is this event important for y'all? So first of all, we are honored to be here, the first one opening the day. Yeah, the Thank you for right, having us. Right straight from the, the keynote as well. Straight up yeah. VIP right VIP. there. Yeah. <laughs> I think one of the things that we love about using open source technologies, you know, we talked on stage on the importance of not having black box platforms. So from our perspective, you know, what you see is what you get, that's one. Secondly, I think that what we are seeing is that uh, we can really achieve that scale. And the, te the technology stack uh, allows us to um, grow and, uh, and do what we need to do. Peter, what about? As a company, we would not be where we are today without Kubernetes. We started our building our cloud later than, than you know, the, the traditional legacy hyperscalers. And we quick, quickly decided that if we're going to beat these giants, we need to choose technologies that people are familiar with and where we don't have to force them into proprietary lock-in. So we built our entire stack around Kubernetes, we're on Kubernetes on bare metal, um, and it helps us both scale, and when customers come to us, it's a familiar interface. They don't have to learn proprietary APIs. And that really lets people hit the ground running and has allowed it to scale. We, we simply couldn't do it without it. Yeah, and again, to your keynote, and I sat there and listened, it was great. I, I think uh, part of what was, I think, really great to see is the scale. And when you talk about scale, what, give some numbers. I mean, you had a whole bunch of numbers on stage, but what were some of the numbers you had there? Um, so we run a lot of GPUs. Yeah. Um, we have hundreds of thousands of GPUs deployed. A lot of, most of them are the last generation, kind of a hopper generation GPUs. Uh, we have around 28 data centers live now, right, I think, and like 10 of them in construction. Uh, like we, we, we plug in a lot of servers. Um, and, and to do this, we both need um, to have the right tooling, right? Like you can't sit and do this manually or even use kind of more traditional legacy technologies like Ansible. Like we need to build this fluidly using cloud native technologies so we can ensemble these systems, build them and evolve them at the same uh, pace as the industry. And you know, and if you think about like, what does that mean, cloud native technologies? Cloud native technologies allows us to deal with the day, how dynamic the environment, the elastic, elasticity as well. And I think that's where really we uh, enjoy Kubernetes. Uh, and maybe the other thing that I think is unique uh, with our scale is that we are creating a, an experience to our customers that help them deal with that scale. So actually we are doing that for them. Yeah. You know, we were just having dinner yesterday uh, with one of our customers and they were saying, hey, you do so much for us, which is cool. Yeah. That's a nice thing to <laughs> yes. hear. Yeah. And, and, and a different type of gratitude from community than you normally hear, you know, it's normally, haggling around price or, or something else. And I, and I think this is interesting. I want to I want to hang out on the scale conversation for a second. Kubernetes at generally are, are programs and applications at scale. AI makes that a whole different ball game. What's the difference there in, in terms of managing at scale and how do you help your customers do uh, that? Uh, so there's a couple different components there, right? That yeah. Tying back to what we, we spoke about in our keynote. First of all, like traditional, you know, when you think about traditional communities, maybe you run a cluster with like 32, 64, 100 VMs in, in a public cloud. Um, and those run on CPUs. CPUs don't tend, tend to break, you know, you run your databases, whatever, like it's a fairly static environment. You, you leave it, you come back a day later, like things look the same. When you deal with these, you know, more complex accelerated compute, they're all interconnected, there's first of all more things that can break and then the scale is much bigger. So we need to both deal with a dynamic shifting environment uh, where we need to do constant health checking and kind of embrace failures because we know they're, ha they're going to happen. And we kind of want them to happen, right? When we, 
when we train AI models and we run AI inferencing, it's a completely different use case than running like a database or a website for a bank, uh, right? We, we don't want to make a trade-off where we're leaving kind of 50% of exactly. the performance on the table for resilience. Then you lost out. Then you're going to train models slower than, than you know, the, your other AI lab competitor, whoever it might be. So we push these systems to the max which is a good thing. We're trying to squeeze everything out of them, but then things are going to break, and marrying this up with kind of the, um, how, how Kubernetes was originally used has been interesting over the last couple of years. So we spent a lot of time using um, kind of open source technologies like Argo workflows. How do we use that to do active health checking? How do we build our own controllers that plug into Kubernetes, you know, using all the regular constructs, writing our own CRDs, but it's still Kubernetes to handle, handle failures, handle life cycle, which has been really exciting. And then we have the scale part as well, uh, which thankfully Kubernetes has also matured a lot over the last couple of years. So that running clusters uh, you know, with 1,000 nodes, no problem, piece of cake. Running them with 10,000 nodes, not as much piece of, piece of cake, but you know, there's a proven way to get there. You need to scale your things correctly, not DDoS your API servers with bad code, and you're going to be fine. Yeah, I, I think to me that, that is one of the key differentiators that you guys bring to the table for this and for AI. I, I, but I, I'm sure you talk to a lot of customers and a lot are still trying to get from proof of concept <laughs> to production and at scale. How, how do you see that and how are you helping customers kind of move through that life cycle? Because a lot of organizations are still struggling with that. We're stuck in you know, POC mode for this, for AI. So it depends, you know, there are different segments of customers. Uh, definitely when we're talking about uh, some of the AI labs that's creating some uh, new uh, models, that they know how to do it. And where we help them is like Peter said, like get the best out of the infrastructure. Okay, get the most out of it, be the most uh, effective, and run uh, as fast as possible. Uh, then for uh, some uh, other use cases of customers, and they, they still very much appreciate, of course, us, uh, helping them focus on other things. You know, I can, you know, one of our customers in the uh, health science uh, space, you know, they're using it uh, just to uh, run on some uh, open data sets, right, and just to uh, it, uh, make some advances in their research, as an example. We, we want our customers to only have to focus on their models, not on the infrastructure. Right? Then with kind of legacy hyperscalers, you need to be an infrastructure expert, we try to take that away from you. Just again, another quote from a customer, I remember we were, we were just sitting and you know, someone said, you know, we got our cluster and I was able to run a job on day one. And that was like, that's their experience. That's um, a big deal. Yeah, it is a big deal today. It is that a big is, deal. That is a big deal. That time to value really matters. It is a big deal today. If we zoom out, right, we look at the yeah. market as a whole, like we're still very early. Like yeah. this, is, oh, this yeah. is still like running training clusters, running GPUs, accelerated compute at scale is still ridiculously hard. Like we, we're, we, um, we're doing well now, but we have so much innovation left. And to really like broaden AI so everyone, uh, everyone, every enterprise there can work with it, can run it, where they're not scared, like, oh, I need to learn what a <laughs> GPU is and how it breaks. Like, we as an industry have a lot to do there, and there's a lot of exciting innovation, and yes, like comparing, you know, comparing the talks, KubeCon this year, last year, and the year before, like 2022, there were not talks about GPUs, or there was one, maybe one GPU talk, and mm -hmm. like, I'm going to learn something from someone else who runs this as a scale, and they had four GPUs. Uh, and, and seeing how this has evolved, and how many people are now, you know, thinking about these problems with are good, but then you look at the talks and people are solving the same problems, uh, which is really frustrating, right? So I think we as an, an industry and we as a community have to come together and align on some patterns, uh, align on some toolings where, uh, you know, being able to run your jobs without it being a, a huge infrastructure nightmare should be the baseline so we can focus truly on innovation. Uh, I think this is a great point, you know, when you think about that to production, how we make the technology more accessible both for the data scientists and the researchers and the platform teams. Uh, and maybe, again, another thing that we've showed in the keynote is the integration we've done with Slurm to Kubernetes. Okay. Right, so this is an example of, of a pattern of how we can bring the tool that researchers, the data scientists are used to. They don't need to know anything about Kubernetes. 
However, they still have the data they need, and their platform team can also manage that at scale. Yeah, well, funny enough, the biggest uh, laugh that you got out of it was that the number one feature was SSH. So that's a, that was a whole, that, that get, got a good, good laugh out of everybody. But <laughs> I, I think, again, especially for organizations where researchers actually want to SSH in and run their models and do that. But what are some of the key, I guess you could say, security concerns, uh, privacy concerns, and regulatory issues that you have to deal with being that you have a lot of proprietary data for these organizations, like you were talking about healthcare, I'm sure it's across all different industries. So I think that this is definitely also, uh, uh, we are still very early on in the journey. A lot of the uh, regular uh, guarantees and, and security, uh, like in encryption and everything, are existed the same way. Uh, I think one interesting part uh, is today that you know, for some of our customers that are, the data is really important for them, we actually offer a lot of flexibility in the deployment model. So a customer can also have a single tenant <coughs> environment, which is really secured from anyone else, and they can really monitor who has access and how. So that's one way. You know, with, with other customers, uh, actually for some of them, the, the data is not uh, confidential or anything like that. It might be even open data sets. But then there are some other new concerns. For example, they are worried about abuse of the platform, uh, that's one, you know, discussion we discussed, uh, uh, for example, can someone manipulate the data? And create from those? So I think this is really early, uh, but I'm pretty confident that we will hear more about it on day two, which is security focus and definitely in the next cube cons. Yeah. I, think, I think you're right. I think, I, I, I think this, this conversation around how early it is, you, mean, you, get, you get the sense of FOMO and people trying to catch up and, and not miss out. We're literally day zero of this, really, I think, at, at, at this stage, and, and just getting to adopt. So what's your advice to teams or your new customers and community when they come in the door and they're feeling overwhelmed and they're just starting to spin up at this level of scale? How do you guide them through that? Um, so, so my advice in, in general is like, try not to boil the ocean. You know, get, get, getting something working yeah. is more important than it, it being perfect. Like we can you know, fine tune all the performance, use all the cool features later, but get something working, let's get a model training, uh, make, make sure it's good, and then iterate from there. You know, take an iterative approach. Uh, we see some, some startups being you know, very ambitious, very aggressive, and then we spend too much time getting up and running, um, chasing that immediate perfection. So that, that's my, my, um, my general recommendation to everyone. And even if you're not looking to be an AI lab, right, if you're an, an enterprise, you know, get comfortable, kind of learn to crawl before you walk, and then, then you're going to run. Um, and in some cases that means like maybe don't go and try to train your own model day one, use an existing one, and then you go to fi fine tuning. And there are so many great open source models uh, now, many of them trained on CoreWeave, that, that you can use to, to kind of get your, your, your use case off the ground so you and, don't need to go crazy. And it's such a, it's, it's a much more, not only is that sage advice in general from a cost perspective, a sanity perspective, getting an early win, it's also much more sustainable. If we have everybody building all of these independent data centers and running all these models, it's an incredible amount of compute. It's an incredible amount of power. There's all these, I love that you're trying to decomplicate, or simplify rather, I guess is the right word for that, the, the, the infrastructure side of this so people can just go out and build. Ken, you mentioned earlier some of the customer use cases that you're seeing folks use. Can you give us a few other examples? Um, uh, you mentioned the researchers and yeah. Um, so let's see what we can talk about. I mean, a, lo a lot of yeah. things. Tell us all the a secrets. A lot of, yeah. That you're a lot, I mean, to. originally <laughs> every, everything was yeah. Yeah. <laughs> originally everything was text models, right? Then we have some some image models. Image models have still been kind of um, like a side thing, not a main not a, not a main use case. Uh, now we're seeing a lot of shift to multimodal, where you have the same model taking video, image, voice, and you can get the different outputs from it, right? Um, we have a lot of interesting uh, use cases, cases coming out from the financial sector as well, where uh, they utilize GPUs you know, to do, so can't, can't go into too much details, but both uh, kind of people who do, do trading type use cases and also simulations. Uh, and that's also increasing, uh, which is, is, in, is interesting to me because I figured it would, like, that wouldn't grow the same pace as kind of traditional AI or generative AI, uh, but it's also exploding in, in kind of really rapid fashion. So, while like the, the marquee headlines are, are AI, we're seeing similar growth in, in finance, we're seeing growth in um, 
health sciences, which I think will be really interesting, super specifically interesting. around the, the impact to the world, right? Like that's also super early, like it's proof of concept stage. Um, there's some drug research that's going on, and a lot of that's going to take longer time because we need to get you know FDA regulators comfortable with it. Uh, but giving the the impact this can have on society, that's obviously where I'm most excited. I couldn't agree with you more. I think the healthcare implication, it's going to save lives. I mean, I, when, when people this are- is super are, exciting. Yeah, when people are, are afraid or in their doomer mode about AI, I always, I, I think that there's so many use cases where it will fundamentally make detection research drug delivery and development so yeah. so much easier. You know, it takes $2 billion to get a drug approved by the F FDA on average. We had a guest on talking about that. Anyway, <laughs> wild stuff. could take A whole us different discussion. Yeah, it's, it's, yes. you're just so inspiring, Peter. You're taking me down, you're taking me down the line. <laughs> what do you hope, I'm curious, you know, obviously big community activation for you here, lots of conversations. What are you hoping to get out of the week? So I, I think that, you know, like Peter said before, it will be very interesting, first of all, for the Kubernetes community to discuss what kind of constructs and primitives we need to create and make it more boring. Because right now it's definitely the opposite of that. Even though I said on stage, this is boring, it's boring because we invested a lot in tooling. Uh, so some of the things we are talking about, how, how the orchestration should look like, what kind of signals and metrics we need to have, uh, the scale that we can achieve. I think that will be a very interesting uh, conversation. The second thing, I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I can't wait to walk the floor uh, and see, I know like the small booth area is usually the most exciting one. Um, so this is Absolutely. just day one, but maybe if we chat like tomorrow, I will have more to say on that. Yeah, and I, I agree with you. Every KubeCon that I've been to, it's like you walk around, you meet someone new, you meet some project you haven't spoken to, and then we get all these ideas, and then we go back, it's like, oh, we should build this, or we should work with these people. So I'm, I'm super excited about walking the floor as well. Also, hopefully, you know, we're growing like crazy. We need amazing talent to build oh. a Kubernetes native ecosystem for AI. So uh, Good job, Peter. For people Great plug, loving, well. loving that, loving that. I should have said that, that's good. Yes, we are <laughs> looking for excellent people to join us, yes. I love it, and, and shout out to the small project section over there, which, which are all the earlier stage CNCF projects for those who might not know. I'm looking in this direction because they are physically over there, and, and I, I, I agree with you all. That's what's exciting. Yeah, it, it, it is exciting, it is exciting, and, and, and there's hundreds of projects too, which is very cool. Yeah. And again, you know, if we think about like what uh, KubeCon and CNCF is all about, it is about enabling innovation. Um, yeah. And this community is just so helpful. I, Rob and I always talk about this, yeah. one of our favorite events every year, well, twice a year, <laughs> because of the culture of collaboration and, and desire to build transparently and, and do things that benefit the entire community and the tech world in general. Last question for you, because I mean, well, Ken, you've been on the show many times. Peter, you nailed it, so we'll definitely have you back. <laughs> yeah, what do you, and, and especially with the plug too, there's a little marketer in you, I can see. It might be the CCO, <laughs> but there's a little marketer in you. <laughs> what do you hope to be able to say when we're sitting down in London or in Atlanta next year at the next KubeCon that you can't yet say today? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I don't, I don't know if it's going to be realized uh, next year, but I want to live in a world where all parts of AI training, AI pipeline can be done purely using cloud native tools on Kubernetes. Um, there is still, still a lot of things you know, coming from like a traditional HPC world that we have to integrate with, um, but, but we really need to unify around these principles we talked around, where we have kind of one ecosystem um, that we can all work on together. Love yeah, that. For sure. Uh, 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 plus one to Peter. Uh, <laughs> again, not, not sure when that will be realized. Uh, it's a lot of work to do. There's a lot of work to do, and this is really uh, early on. Uh, but at some point, I would love this to be boring. Yeah. yeah. I love that as a goal. I like that you mentioned that. Because then we can focus on other exciting things. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, <laughs> well for, thank you for this very not boring interview. <laughs> However, both of you were absolutely fabulous. Rob, always a treat. I'm so always excited good. for the whole week. It's yeah. going to be absolutely wonderful. And I hope that all of you are just as excited for our three days of coverage here at KubeCon in Salt Lake City. My name is Savannah Peterson. You're watching theCUBE, the leading source for enterprise tech news.